So hi, I'm Andre Marquez. Yeah. And I'm Daniel Zacarias. And from our office here in Lisbon, um, welcome to the first episode of Productize Talks, where we will talk with top speakers, industry leaders and experts in search of answers to the questions how to create great products. Each episode will cover topics such as product thinking, product design and product management and we'll focus on products at the intersection of the digital and physical world um, on software, web and mobile, created by startups as well as big companies alike uh, that are delighting customers with solutions that are thoughtful, precise and humorous. So the first episode is with Harden Kittler. Harden is Director of Mobile Product Management at Ching. Um, Harn has a background in media economics and has always considered himself a generalist who connects people and dots. Um, first 11 years of his career were spent with digital creative agency Fork in Hamburg, uh, consulting a, with international brands and retailers such as Nivea and Odo. And in 2011, Arn joined Ching, the leading professional network for German speakers. Founded in 2003, Ching is one of Germany's biggest agile product organizations with over 30 product managers. Wow, that's a lot of managers to be managed. Since 2014, Arn is responsible for Ching's mobile products. As an active networker, Arn has been involved also in organization of Product Tank Amber since 2013 and will host Product Tank during the Mobile Congress later this month in Barcelona. So, hi Harn, many thanks for being here today and you know, uh, for traveling to, to, to Lisbon from your hometown. Um, it's great having you here in the podcast and uh, let us maybe start with, uh, with Hamburg, where you're coming from, right? Um, mm -hmm. So how's the startup scene there? Um, and uh, I guess the question here relates also to other German cities and mm -hmm. how the ecosystem plays a little bit in Germany, which is, of course, very Berlin-centric, at least to the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah first of all, uh, thanks for having me here. It's, it's great to be here in Lisbon. And, thanks. Um, yeah, but I mean, to be honest, um, I'm probably not the best connoisseur of the German startup scene, so uh, but I'll I'll tell you what my impression is. So we we do have great startups in Hamburg as well as in other cities, and uh, I think actually probably the Hamburg scene is better than than you would think. I mean we we do not have as many like world famous startups than uh, as as Berlin has. Uh, so so some of the of the bigger famous startups are of course based in, uh, based in Berlin. But for instance, we have great companies like Stuffel, which uh, which is a mobile um, how do you say um, wh where you can sell your stuff uh, to to people in the neighborhood, um, and it's a very great product. You should you should check it out. And there are also other interesting startups who, for instance, don't build product but build services. So, for instance, a former colleague of mine, uh, she and her husband have a startup called AppCamps, and uh, what they do is they uh, they train. Uh, young people like uh, school children uh, to learn app development mm -hmm. and they've set up their own curriculum and are now looking for are already in process of sharing that to schools so that not only they can do these trainings but that they can also empower teachers to to have these trainings and get uh, get young people uh, on board of app development very very early so this is two two examples of the Hamburg startup scene that I'm particularly fond of um, yeah. Uh, so uh, one, one of the, the topics um, you briefly talked about yesterday during your product tank presentation here in Lisbon, uh, which by the way was really, uh, really very uh, thoughtful and interesting, uh, was that most startups end up not having at the beginning at least uh, product managers as a role, as a defined role, and end up having um, the CEO playing as product manager. Um, so what? What I mean, one of, one of the things that we are um, starting to see, at least here in the Portuguese ecosystem, is the is the role of the product managers being a little bit more valued than it was mm -hmm. in maybe some years ago. Yeah. Um, and startups, of course, they, they they cannot afford sometimes to have their own product manager. So how do you see the CEO product manager role uh, and what would you uh, recommend startups to, to do? I mean, should they hire a product manager from the beginning? Should the CEO just you know wear the product manager 
had for a while. Um, you also talked about the CEO dash product manager uh, conflict, um, if so, and whoever gets more power inside the company. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's your opinion for startups? I think it depends on on the what type of person the CEO is. Mm -hmm. So if if the CEO is a very strong product person, mm. I, th I think then, you know, I mean, when you start a very small organization, you should probably just bring this knowledge and experience and, and thinking into your product directly. Um, whereas, I mean, there are also some CEOs whose qualities are probably different and, and other things than, than, than being a really good product leader, in which case it's probably then better to, to, to bring someone who really knows product from the beginning. and. Ideally, I mean, I think this is something that is that I've seen often as a mistake is that when CEOs hire their first product people, they hire rather junior people mm. because they're cheap and uh, maybe also because they do what they're being told. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, well, this is actually not something that I believe in. So I think I think if as a CEO you kind of let go of your product and you've made the decision to to say, okay, I I will now. Uh, leave the product in somebody else's hand and pick somebody strong that you can really trust because in the end the efficiency and, and, and the power that I mean not power in terms of uh, you know di only decision power but also the impact that a product manager can have on their their product really depends on the trust that this person has and and if it's just you know a starter that that nobody really trusts in the company then the this product manager will, will have a hard time having the right impact on the uh, on the product and will always be circumvented by, by the CEO's opinions, which which probably doesn't help anyone. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you're touching a point which is essentially what we have here, which is the belief system. Um, and and at the end of the day, it's a lot of, I think it has a lot to do with um, uh, opinionated people um, and how, how strong you, you express your your, your feelings towards the product roadmap, evolution, um, certain features, etc. So, um, what kind of belief system should a good product manager um, have? Uh, is there is there a, a specific psychological traits that you believe are important for product managers? Well, I think it's the the, the tricky thing for, for for product managers is to to clearly be a leader. But not in an egoistic way. So um, I like to, to the CEO. Sorry, opposite to the CEO or in tune to the CEO. To be honest, I mean, yeah, I mean, probably it's also it also would be good traits for a C CEO. But but I think as a CEO, it's, uh, it's probably you you can get by a little better if you're still being very egoistic. Whereas as a product uh, manager, I think you really have to be a team player and and. It, shouldn't think that you're the expert on everything. I think I think you will only succeed if you also take uh, the, the people you work with serious enough to to really um, make the best out of the interdisciplinary team that you have, and, and and not just try to force your own ideas through the whole time. I think that's that's. Yeah, there's this saying of uh, having strong opinions uh, weakly held, um, mm -hmm. in, in the sense of uh, yeah, you should strive for uh, some sort of vision or direction, but be open to receiving uh, new inputs that change your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's kind of a, that's a tough thing to, to, to be uh, aware of and be good at, because, you know, we like our own ideas, or we get enamored by uh, our own thoughts, and, and, and how, how, how can we gain uh, this sort of emotional distance from, uh, from what we are trying to do? Uh, that's that's kind of, that's my the, the big issue I think. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you say that we need to exercise this emotional distance from our own ideas so that what wins is whatever is best for the product, not what's best for our ego or mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are two things. I mean, one as kind of a just as an attitude, I think curiosity is always helpful to have, and as long as you are very curious, this will keep your eyes and ears open to to, to other things. So, mm -hmm. so I think that's. A very important um, attitude uh, uh, or trait a, a product manager should have, and the second thing, and that's something you can more consciously do, is to be really clear about um, um, about sorry 
what are your what, what are your assumptions and hypotheses? Mm -hmm. So not be, not thinking that everything that your opinion or your views right now is always a fact, but that most of the things y you will have in your head are merely assumptions, mm -hmm. and being open that they are just assumptions and being also willing to well verify or, uh, or falsify them in a transparent way that is shared with your team and and uh, with your stakeholders. I think that's. Um, what what really helps to to avoid a um, finalized a finalized yeah. vision? Yeah. So when when you joined uh, Gene in 2011, I guess you jo joined just after Lars, uh, the founder, uh, had left the company, or mm -hmm. did you still uh, meet him? No, not really. I, okay, I haven't met him. Um, I think he left. Two years or so before, before I started. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think you left in 2009, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, and I started 2011. Um, so was this was this Mark still present in the company? Was this uh, I, I guess CEO dash product vision still imprinted in the DNA of Chain, or you know um, the the company had taken over? Or I think actually the company had taken over. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, when I when I started, probably the stronger influence on the on the product organization was the fact that Xing uh, had had Marty Kagan over for consulting yeah. uh, a year before, and he really influenced the way we still do do product today. So so the way the teams are set it uh, set up in, in dedicated standing teams, this principle of triage that I talked about yesterday of always looking for within a, a cross uh, disciplinary team having a design lead, a tech lead, and the product uh, person together uh, get very early on the, in the process, making sure that, that the direction is right, etc. So those are things that Marty brought in, I believe, and uh, that really shaped the way we work. We've, we've done some, some changes, of course, since then, but that, that was a stronger influence, I felt, than the influence of Lars. I mean, still, of course, it's his company, or the company he founded, so, mm -hmm. uh, but just in terms of the product organization, it was Marty rather than Lars. I mean, the, uh, Marty is a big proponent of the dual track, agile kind of, uh, you know, discovery and delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you when you talk about triage, uh, in that sense, is uh, that team is in charge of doing the discovery part of the mm -hmm. of the product development and then uh, feeding that into the regular uh, delivery uh, agile track. That's that's kind of the the blueprint of it. Uh, I mean, we. We consciously leave a lot of flexibility to our teams to how exactly they do things. So, so it's not super prescribed, and everybody has to do it exactly that way. But that's kind of kind of the thinking. I mean, we do also have this distinction between discovery and uh, delivery uh, work. Even though I must say that this has changed a bit uh, since I've been with Xing, because um, we now aim more for very early implementation in the face of. Of users because like you can you can discover forever and uh, but in the end it, it, it gets really valuable when you really have something out at least in front of a few users so yeah. we, we are we have put more emphasis on very early a b testing for instance and like in our product organization we we have like one of our beliefs is we call factualized i think it's a made up english word but anyways it's this is again about this thing like n not dealing too much with assumptions and hypotheses but really getting to the point where you can Quantify what's what's really happening out there and what your users really do with uh, a, a new feature that you've thought about, or which of two alternatives that you have in your mind they really like better. So this is something that wasn't as prominent when I when I joined, and that is much more prominent right now. Great. So uh, taking a step back, maybe uh, for those that may be unfamiliar with Zing, uh, uh, could you help us describe? Uh, what the product is and what your role in the organization is? Yeah, so Xing um, is a, a professional network focused around people, news, and jobs. Uh, we've been around since 2003, and uh, currently we have a rather large product organization with about 30 product managers who are basically structured along uh, different verticals uh, that we have inside the company. So, so if, uh, if going for uh, other markets outside of the German-speaking market, uh, is, uh, is, th is, is that an own goal for, for Zing at the moment? Yeah, at the moment it's clearly something we don't do. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's welcome to register, but we are not actively aiming to, to go into that. How does that limit your 
your product management role. I mean, knowing that you have this box where you have to work and you have to be very good, um, how does that limit your workspace and, um, or, or, or is there any limit whatsoever? To be honest, I, I don't see it so much as a limit. Mm. Um, you have what, 100 million uh, German speakers in Europe? Uh, yeah, kind of that like, about 18, okay, so 18 in Germany and then eight, uh, less than, so yeah, yeah. I think it's 120 overall, uh, generally speaking, okay. um, so that's population, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't find it limiting, to be honest, because I think that's, I mean, it's a strong economical um, region. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the, 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 what it has as a challenge, but I don't see that as a negative challenge, but rather as a positive challenge, is, is of course, I mean, yes, we, we cannot just go by saying, okay, now we well, we conquer India, and, and there are many, many new people signing up from India. But we really have to think: okay, how, what are additional services that we can provide to our, uh, to our audience? And I mean, also we still have room to grow within within our markets. Like we're currently in those markets uh, at about nine million uh, users, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think th there's still room to grow uh, for us. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see it as a limitation. Right. And it helps focus, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's also one thing, like, yeah. if, if I were to build a fully global product, uh, yeah. then, then but being don't, in don't, close don't touch... Don't you fear you, 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 you have the threat of being insularized? Insularized in the sense that, um, you know, picking up on Darwin's, uh, it's like one of those birds that end up, you know, living in this ecosystem far, far away from the rest of the, um, you know, of the continental shelf and because they're not exposed to so many uh, predators and so many um, uh, threats they end up developing traits which are very specific to that ecosystem they really work well but as soon as um, other players will come to that ground they are um, they are not so well prepared so don't you feel that this this will lead Singh uh, end up developing uh, very specific tools to the German speaking market. Uh, is this a, com a long standing competitive advantage in your opinion, or um, I think it is. And and I mean to be honest, it, it's not uh, like that. We we uh, currently are the only ones operating in our markets. Right. I mean, yeah. um, we we, we do have a, we, we do have uh, international competitors in several areas. We have. LinkedIn as one competitor, yes. we do have competitors in the jobs area, we have competitors in the events era, area, etc. And, and they are all operating in Germany. Of course, they are all also trying to address the same audience that we are addressing. So um, it's not, I mean, we are, we are prepared for the competition and we are in this competition already. Mm -hmm. And But what I'm seeing is that so far we've People found are really your specific feature sets. Yeah, apparently they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, different kind of uh, things, um, you've you've done a lot of consulting work, and you've uh, and you now work for a very large organization, uh, and that means that you've dealt with your fair share of uh, ex experience with the human side of making software products, digital products. You've uh, you have to deal with a lot of. Maybe office politics, stakeholder communications, consensus, consensus building, uh, and a lot of what many uh, PMs might call uh, non-productive kind of work. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what what would you say are the most important skills that product managers should develop in this regard? Because I, I think that's probably an area that uh, a lot of uh, product managers feel um, there's a room to improve. Yeah, room to, to improve. Office politics. Uh, yeah, uh, no, the dealing, uh, m getting, getting people aligned towards making a, a great product. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the. I think that's one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. for many PMs. I mean, when I when I compare the the two main jobs I've had in my professional life so far, I think there are some things that are similar and some that are different. And something that is similar is the whole in team collaboration, like how do you as a non-developer work with developers, how do you work with designers, learning to communicate with each other, learning to do something meaningful together. I think that's the same no matter if you're an agency or if you're a product at a company. Uh, what's different is kind of 
the, the the triggers that you work with because like if you're if you're doing agency work basically you have to do what the client tells you and no matter how good the client relationship is mm -hmm. in the end the the kind of direction you will be given by a client will always be more um, leave less room for 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 your own work uh, and and uh, be, be closer to execution uh, than you can do in a in a product role in a company mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's I think that's one of the reasons why I changed from agency work to 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 the uh, company side because now. I mean, I'm I'm still having stakeholders and I'm I'm having uh, yeah. superiors, of course. Uh, and but the thing is that they don't tell me what to do. Uh, but we are talking about goals and uh, we are talking about the intent and, and w w what what it really is that we want to do. And uh, the same is what what I do with my teams. I, I don't tell them what to do, and that's different from from a like agency client situation, where sometimes even if the client comes with a very specific mm -hmm. feature thing. I mean, you, can, you may not like it, but you sometimes have to, have to do it. And this is something that, at least in our organization, uh, I'm lucky to have management who have understood that direct feature requests from the CPO are not so welcome and that we should, on that level, rather talk about uh, goals and, and, and the intent of what we do. What, was that always your experience there? What, uh, when you got to Zine, was, was it already working uh, as healthily as that? Because I've seen a lot of product organizations that even, uh, despite the fact that there are also product organizations, there are plenty of uh, CEO requests and uh, that, you know, Founders request whatever uh, and just make it onto the product uh, somehow. Put it on the product. Mm -hmm. uh, was that always your experience there, or did you uh, help create that kind of uh, environment? I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't take credit for that. Yeah. I do believe we have improved in this regard, but actually, even when I joined, it was not like already then it was it, it was healthy otherwise I wouldn't have joined to be honest like this is something that really yeah. I, I wanted as part of my change to the to the yeah. company side during product and so I before I joined Xing I actually asked around and, and made sure that this was uh, this was actually uh, the case and uh, but but we've improved this and like for instance this off task level format that I spoke about yesterday yeah. has really helped us also to be more conscious about uh, what we talk about on which level yeah, that, that leads me to, to, to my next question, which is uh, you're, you're a director of product management, a ma a director of product management, which means that you're uh, managing product managers more than you're managing a product per se. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and what would you say are the differences between uh, those two roles and, and how do you make that uh, transition? Uh, mm -hmm. Um, maybe to quickly explain what it is that I do, like I'm, I'm the director for the mobile platforms at Xing, which means that we do have platform teams for the native mobile um, platforms as well as for the APIs as, as well as for mobile infrastructure. And I'm basically the head above the respective product owners that we have in those teams. And I mean, one main d difference is that I don't have an operative team that I work with on a daily basis. This is what my what the product owners on my team uh, will do, and so I see my role. I mean, one important part of my role certainly is the stakeholder management. I'm not the only one doing stakeholder management. It's also my the product owners on my team do that as well. But I'm I'm trying to well take the. The, the, the bigger topics and and the more difficult ones away or I'm also part of the escalation process so if, if for instance a product owner on my team and a product owner that he collaborates with mm -hmm. in another team if they find out in their collaboration that they have conflicting goals that they cannot resolve themselves then they would typically escalate that to me as well as my uh, uh, my, my peer in, in, in the other part of the organization and uh, we would then help give direction and say, okay, these are the priorities and now uh, go back and, and continue uh, looking for a solution together. Yeah, uh, still talking about conflicts, um, is, is there a, a German flavor to product management? Um, because lo 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 lots of stories about uh, German um, German um, joint ventures with uh, mostly American companies uh, come up and surface about how difficult it is for Americans to deal with German managers and <clears throat> sometimes um, this became very, um, lots of stories especially when the Mercedes group uh, joined Chrysler uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them actually became jokes of uh, 
but you know, recurrently um, you have uh, you have stories of um, Americans being kind of uh, okay with some kind of ambiguity, and, mm -hmm. and Germans wanting very clear uh, definitions of uh, hierarchies or. Uh, wanting to know to whom they report exactly and not uh, leaving that up to the year. So, um, it, it, is there uh, specific German traits in, in terms of the uh, product vision, product management, in your opinion? I mean, to be honest, I've I've never worked in an American organization, so mm -hmm. uh, I must be careful not not um, to to oversimplify uh, when I when I comment on this. I think it's not so much like my my picture of of at least how we work, and, and this is maybe not fully representative of Germany sure. as, uh, as such, but uh, the way we work... But, but you, you, do, you, do, you do know the, the, the product management scene, uh, I mean also exposed to the product tank, so I guess you, you have a, mm -hmm. a wider vision. That That's true, I mean I, I, know, I know how other people work and I would not so much make the difference in, in terms of uh, well, us being particularly fond of hierarchy as such, mm -hmm. but we are clearly interested in Clarity, <laughs> and uh, and this also means that that like uh, you know leaving uh, leaving things for a long time in a state of ambiguity and and you you know you, you just realize you have different opinions but you kind of leave it at that. This is sometimes we do that as well, but we we, 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 we actually like to actively resolve such conflicts of interest and surface and them the, the and, hard make, questions and make them make them explicit because that's the only way to uh, to tackle them. So so what I don't like and. Uh, in, is, is to have such conflicts just idling around, kind of under the surface, and, and b because this is blocking work. Actually, this is this is making you slow. This is this is these are the kind of things where after half a year you say, hey, wh why didn't we get this thing moving forward in the way we should? And then yeah, there was this, you know, we couldn't really agree on this thing. So let's not do that. Let's like if if if, if there is a conflict of interest, let's let's be open about it and let's let's do something about it and. So what, would you say that Zing is a, a product-led organization, or is it, uh, or are the inputs for the strategy coming also from uh, sales or marketing or you know, some other internal team? Uh, what the, there's a there's a classical conflict of uh, salespeople uh, agreeing to some feature set that isn't even on the roadmap, but uh, it made them close the deal. Uh, is that kind of uh, thing a problem for, for you, or are you, mo uh, since you're mostly uh, directly, uh, I, I guess would say you would do, you're dealing with consumers, so maybe you're not as exposed to, to a large sales organization? How, how does that work? I mean, that's a very big source of conflict, usually for PMs and um, other parts of the, of, of the organization. Yeah, I think. Well, we have to give several answers to this. To be yeah. honest, like I, I wouldn't say we are a product organization, mm -hmm. even though it would sound nice. But I think a company like like our size always needs to consider several uh, several aspects and not yeah. just the product thing. Of course, our overall company strategy, uh, the, the the vision about product plays an important role in it. Mm -hmm. And I also do believe that uh, we as product people inside the company have an important say. Mm -hmm. That's what matters to me. Uh, with regards to the influence of in particular sales, uh, it really differs what part of our organization you look at. I mean, most of the product we build is a B2C product, which uh, where well, there's essentially no sales. <laughs> so we, we, I mean, we do have a growth team and yeah. we do user acquisition, but that's not a sales team. And uh, we do have B2B parts of the organization in our e-recruiting part, for instance, or in our events business, uh, and also our advertising business. And uh, of course, in those parts of the organization, uh, they will have their own like uh, small leadership teams in which, of course, sales is strongly represented and will also have an influence. And I, I mean, I used to work in one of the B2B sectors uh, of the thing, which was the events business. And of course, there I was collaborating closely with uh, my sales colleagues. But actually, what I found is it, it, the best way to do to deal with that is not to see sales as the enemy, because I mean, in the end, you can also see them as a very good uh, channel for insights from from your customers. Yeah. Of course, what you what no product person will like is to you know uh, get direct 
direct features put uh, put through the uh, sales teams onto onto the roadmap, but but you don't have to do that. But but you actually can listen closely, and, and there's actually a lot to take away from the daily exposure that uh, that your sales team have to the markets, and also I mean of course also the the paying B two B customers, they are important. Mm -hmm customers and, and users of your product, so, so I think it would not be okay to, to ignore them and, and pretend that they are not there, that's, that's just not reality. So, yeah, I, so, so I, I don't see this like, it's, it's, it's in general like kind of a, a, a big gap, ideally you should try yeah. to bridge that gap and, and, and deal with it in a, in a conscious manner. And that, that's, all, that's all about the, this alignment uh, uh, issue and uh, how do you build on that. And uh, yesterday we talked about uh, this framework uh, which you called uh, Austax Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm, okay, I'm getting better at it. Uh, <laughs> so so can I pronounce it? <laughs> uh, and um, so, and you how uh, and you you talked about how how you use that in terms of uh, setting uh, uh, a bigger uh, a better view of what what's to be done and why it should be done and and get alignment both from the bottom up and also from the top down and. I would guess that it probably used across uh, different, uh, also used across different areas of the company. Yeah. Uh, so, um, can you walk us through how how that kind of uh, uh, strategy and consensus building around this very specific framework for of how to format it uh, can help you build on that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we we, we introduced Auftragsklärung as we like to call it uh, last year. And we've since rolled it out to, to the whole, uh, to all product teams inside the company. And we've actually also used it on a, on a more strategic level in terms of, of uh, um, sharpening the, the annual goals that we have for, for uh, bigger parts of the organization, not just from a product angle, but mm -hmm. also from, from an overall angle. And um, basically what it, what it does is it forces you to ask the tricky questions very early. It forces you to be really clear about your intent and get alignment about the why you're doing something and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that then the team that's actually building something and working with it has maximum autonomy with regards to how exactly they do it. So, so the, that's, that's kind of the general thinking behind this is, is like in this, in this balance of autonomy and alignment, mm -hmm. we believe that there's only autonomy in the way a team can work if they have enough of an alignment with their superiors as well as the, the rest of the, uh, the company around them. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise they, they will just not be granted the necessary freedom to, to, to work uh, autonomously. Okay, so um, um, this is a very interesting tool that you uh, described and, and um, can you walk us through uh, its origin and uh, and how do you deploy it uh, in practice uh, mm -hmm. in the in the organization? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the origin maybe to explain like we, we we started last year just with the with the first draft of what the what the things were that we yeah. we wanted to look at for uh, for each new initiative. We then basically iterated around it, and uh, one thing that helped us uh, with iterating around it was actually that that we. Uh, met a guy called Stephen Bungay from, from the uh, UK and what we learned from him that was interesting that's one of the reasons also why I like to stick to the German word Auftragsklärung even though it's hard to pronounce for people in Portugal I understand but you're doing very well um, is that there's an uh, interesting revival I'd say of um, uh, 19th century Prussian army uh, military theories from, from guys like Helmut von Moltke and basically the thinking that they had at those times resonates very well with the, with the startup world or with the digital business world that we have today because what they found is that the apparently classical style of leading troops in a very clear command and control style uh, was not successful in times of uncertainty and also not in times of scaling. And uh, this is the parallel to our world, of course, because we are in high uncertainty and we are also all trying to scale as organizations. So basically, instead of giving commands and expecting to people to do exactly what you tell them to do, they said it's more important to be really clear about what your intent is and where you want to go and uh, then leave the people enough autonomy to, to still decide on the spot 
uh, what, what is the best thing they should be doing, but still have enough guidance to, uh, to basically make sure that one team doesn't go off in a totally different direction from another team. So this, this kind of thinking uh, helped us to sharpen the format that we have now. And um, the way it works is basically we have several fields in there that, that, that we work with. Uh, one is stating the context. That is basically why are we talking at all? Like what is the situation and what is the complicated thing about the situation that well, leads us to think about a new initiative? Uh, then the most important thing is to state what our intent is and that will usually be like what is the intent of the product manager who is initiating this initiative mm -hmm. and this is ideally this is now uh, kind of stealing a little bit from Stephen Bunga he calls this question for intent like the Spice Girls questions what do you really really want <laughs> uh, and ideally you know you can you can write many many pages about what you really really want but if you manage to get it into a tweet it's even better like try to be really concise about it then uh, it's since you will usually as a creative product manager have several great intents that you think you could follow you of course will make a conscious decision which of those you uh, pick mm -hmm. and you do this by stating like how does your intent fit into the higher intent of uh, well the organization and the people above you basically one or two, like strategy how does this fit with the st strategy one and two levels up mm -hmm. And um, then the next thing we will be looking at is what are the boundaries? Um, no, sorry, it's not the boundaries first, it's first the outcome, um, okay. which is an important focus we are, we've now been putting for the last two years, I think, so we don't focus so much on output anymore. We really look for what is the actual outcome, what, mm -hmm. does, what does this change uh, for our users and then also subsequently for us as a company. Mm -hmm. And um, so for, for the outcome, we really want to uh, state that in a way that's uh, measurable, that's uh, kind of a, a metric that we can track and ideally a specific metric, not just saying, okay, we want to increase activity because everything you do can increase activity, trying to be really sharp about it and also stating an ambition level, like do you want to get a 10% increase or a 10x increase yeah. so that you can talk about it. And the, the aim of this is not so much to have something then where, where at the end somebody comes and punishes you if you only made 9x instead of 10x. It's, uh, it's more to, to indicate uh, clearly, um, uh, like basically give you, give you a framework so, so you can see if you're on the right track to, to reaching the intent that, that you have. Because it will usually not be something that you implement and then from one day to the other, bam, you're there. It's usually product development is a, is a longer process and you, you need to know how you can see if, if you're on the right track or if you need to, to make amendments. So that's the outcome. Uh, next thing we would look at is boundaries. So even if you reach uh, or if you're on the right track to a certain outcome, there may be certain things that must not happen. So for instance, uh, you, you're increasing a certain activity metric, but the sign-up rates of new users must not go down caused by, by the solutions you uh, implement. It's also good to state that up front and, and not just have somebody complain about it afterwards. Um, and then uh, the, the, the last two components that we have is the input. It's basically what, what do you need, like how much time with how many people do you intend to work on something, what are important decisions th that you need, and what, what I find like in a large product, product organization like ours very important is like what's your expectation from other teams. Mm -hmm. Stating that really explicitly instead of just chatting about it in an informal way and then being surprised later on if well it didn't have uh, the reliability that you that, that, that you were hoping for. So so uh, basically, if you uh, at Xing, if you put another team in the input part of your Auftrag and say, okay, I want the data science team to give me a new call for uh, people recommendations, for instance, they need to know about it. Otherwise, you're cheating. <laughs> yeah. And uh, lastly, it's the output. And uh, the output is basically when do you have something uh, tangible in front of your real users. Summing up, like the the two main thing is being really clear about the intent, and that's the most tricky thing. Like it's like it's very easy to first write it down, but when you really try to again and again and again iterate around it, challenge it, this is really that that helps you sharpen your thinking, and that's that's really valuable thing to to get right, and being clear about the outcome. Those those are the two things that really have uh, value. What, what kind of uh, what kind of imp um, considerations goes into a product managers uh, believe in a given outcome. I mean, uh, how um, how do I get to that point where I believe that uh, working on this piece of 
uh, epic theme, whatever, uh, is going to make for an improvement on uh, 10x or 10%? What kind of in signals do they use to reach that conclusion? Is it based on their own, uh, you know, knowledge about the product? Is it based on uh, customer feedback they're getting? Is is it uh, what kind of research goes into projecting that this particular uh, problem space, if if tackled, would lead us to a 10% or 10x increase? I'd say it's a, it's a mix of things. I mean, in general, okay. we like to work more and more with data that we have. And okay. as, a, as a platform that has been around for 13 years now, we do have a lot of data that yeah. we can actually benefit from by, by analyzing it carefully. And for instance, I do have an... Uh, user analytics guy sitting in my team who, who can help us do that okay. uh, because some of this is too tricky for me to do to be <laughs> honest <laughs> and um, so that's, that's one part another part is how do you say I mean uh, some part of it is still ambition I would say so, okay. so it's not about being really sure yeah. but uh, having thought really hard like what what is an ambitious but still realistic outcome to achieve and I mean part of what we do with the Auftrags Terrung um, is this is not about one guy or girl sitting down writing something in, in, in their uh, chamber of solitude uh, it's, it's about basically triggering a dialogue between people and when you do that and you, you bring in for instance uh, people from, from the other teams that you want to uh, cooperate with this will usually help also to sharpen your understanding of what is a what is a realistic ambition level because they may have other experiences, other insights. Uh, so, so that that helps also. Great. Yeah. Uh, um. Maybe just uh, on a related note, but um, coming to a conclusion, um, what what products inspire you the most? Not necessarily digital products, but um, do you have any strong relation with specific brands, products that? Inspire, inspire you as a product manager. Mm. Or I mean, one one thing that currently really fascinates me is is the way how well new ways of onboarding that are happening. Like for instance, just this morning, I, I downloaded the new Quartz app, mm -hmm. and they have now kind of a conversational way of delivering news and. And the onboarding just was really nice. It was was in this uh, dialogish style, and it, it just appealed to me. Like I, I really enjoyed doing it, and I think it really helped to set my relation to this product on a good foundation. Like I now have a very positive attitude to, towards the new Quartz app, yeah. even though I have not used it very. I mean, I just downloaded it this morning, and and once I was done with the onboarding, I, I had to move uh, to, to, to other stuff. But that's that's kind of something that that already in the first in instances is both well interesting. Like I mean, this this form of representing news in a in a dialogue fashion is actually I'm curious about it from a professional angle. But that also appealed to me from how it was done and, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, it, it spoke to me somehow. Okay. And then another, yeah, yeah, yeah. another thing that I'm, I'm interested in more from a, from a professional perspective is of course the aspect of, of scaling. How do, you, how do you set up a scaling product organization and what does this mean for still building even though you kind of split responsibilities for a product into more and more people and more and more teams how do you manage to create a coherent uh, overall experience? And this is something, for instance, where, where, where we're looking at what, what Spotify is doing. Mm -hmm. we, we, we went to visit them uh, last April to, to talk Stockholm. with a team of theirs in Stockholm and, mm -hmm. and talk about how they, how they do their platform teams, how they have set them up, uh, how they introduced it to the rest of the company. And <coughs> so this is, from a professional angle, mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. From a personal personal point of view, any products that you love mm. or that you could not live without? Um, I'm a big fan of Pocket, for instance, mm -hmm. because it fits my style of coming across interesting things at a time where I don't have the time to fully go into depth and uh, so usually I have some time in the evenings after I have taken uh, my daughters to bed and I still stay upstairs where our uh, bedrooms are so in case they need my help and that gives me usually about an hour each each evening to read through the things that I've 
collected every day. This is this is something that that really helps fit this uh, lifestyle. Your PGD lifestyle. Um, <coughs> technology technology wise, are are you excited about anything that's coming up um, and maybe impacting on your professional life or? You're not so much excited about anything right now. <laughs> no, I'm excited about many things. It's uh, it's the thing is that I'm I'm actually more interested in the changes in well user behavior mm -hmm. and, and, and and the general paradigms of how we communicate and how we interact with media rather than the technology itself. Like I'm not a geek in in, in, in that sense that I I'm the first one to mm -hmm. to try out a new technology. I'm I'm rather the observer type that that tries to look at, okay, what is this actually doing with people? And I mean, of course, this whole topic of uh, messengers as platforms, chatbots, this, this whole topic and what that really means for users and what that means for a society, mm -hmm. I think is really, really interesting. Like, I really believe that we will have, uh, we will see more conversational interfaces coming. And, uh, but the tricky thing or the tricky question is like, in which areas is this actually a good thing and in which areas is it a, a dangerous or a stupid thing to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think nobody can answer that question right now properly, but this is one thing that I'm observing with a lot of uh, curiosity right now. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we had it all, right? Um, so thanks a lot again for, for yeah. having us uh, for, I guess, 15 minutes or so. And, um, and we'll be coming back um, for the, I mean, I hope to see you back for the prioritized conference in 2016 here mm -hmm. in, in Lisbon, October, um, the, the 20th um, of October here in Lisbon. Um, otherwise, Daniel, you want to say something? Uh, no, I could go on uh, for a long, uh, a long while uh, talking to you. It's a really interesting uh, and a very, uh, really insightful uh, conversation. So uh, really thank you for, for your time today. Yeah. Thank you too. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. See you in October. Mm -hmm.